So thank you for your presence in front of your computers. Thank you also for the uh, technical stuff. Doing this. Let's come to the next um, presentation. Hartmut Grassel is the speaker uh, working in the Meteorological uh, Society in Frankfurt, uh, working with the WHO in Geneva and a, a co-publisher uh, of a scientific review, having uh, gained so much renown beyond Germany, und ich denke with justice, mal, with good reason. And he has done a lot for climate research. He has a lot of a wealth of other functions, partly volunteering. And so I'm very glad to for him to have found the time to come and speak for climate change regions in the climate change. How much do we need to differentiate? So sorry, no, we, uh, there was a sound, sorry. So let's meine Mutter my mother aus Leipzig. is from Leipzig. Und wenn sie erregt war, and when she was excited about something, Sächsische. then she spoke Und Saxon dialect. dialect. I jetzt nicht speak zu Ihnen, a largely Bavarian dialect. Und ich habe but not to you now. You Klima, now just listen to an accent of Bavarian dialect. Uh, as to climate change, I do not like this word very much Im because in German, Klimawandel change is such a positive word. But we, climatologists, speak about threats and hazards when speaking about climate change. So I would prefer the English word climate change. It just change, a neutral word, but in German, Wandel is a more positive and ancient word, but it has become established and we cannot edge it away. The title I selected is not selected by me, but Mr. Marchulat asked me to use it, proposed it, suggested it, and I did not contradict his suggestion because I know that typically this is a wish uttered by the organizers for the keynote speakers in order to put on him this kind of narrow outline. So le let's start with the first outline. A general statement regarding our climatologists. Every systematic change of the energy balance of the planet Earth, be it by changes of the track around the sun or by the radiation density of the sun and or by the composition of the atmosphere, must lead to diverging regional climate changes. This is a kind of commonplace statement, but we should remember this. Because ocean and land surfaces show regionally highly diverging changes of the energy uh, balance, leading, uh, causing a reaction of general circulation in the atmosphere and in the oceans along time scales from individual hours up to centuries. There's always climate change. Also, if there would be no, there's no man on earth and only apes or primates or, ne or no primates at all, then there would be climate changes. And climate change due to the living sphere, due to wildlife and to the biological creatures is all contributing to climate change. When looking at the three most important three components of the earth, 
Let's start with nitrogen, oxygen and argon as the three main ga gases. Then you have 99.96% of all molecules for these gases. They are not relevant to the climate. The per mills, the final per mills, are actually the contributing factors. Water vapor, carbon dioxide, uh, other uh, methane and other uh, gases are just, let's say, uh, side effects or one, point, uh, one degree Celsius might be the input against uh, the greenhouse effect of 30 to 35 degrees. And I, s I give a range for uh, this change is because uh, there are different formulas behind. So uh, you also have to look at the regional items. So we see Earth has an ocean, should we use an albedo? Uh, should we look at just rocks similar to the, to the moon? So and there in the end we have a change of values between 30 and 35 percent. So we can say our atmosphere is a product of life in itself, not of human life. We are la latecomers, so to say. Our contribution is minimal. Let's say during the past few centuries we have um, caused first traces in the composition of the atmosphere. Then let's have a look at w what a common situation is. Six, 670 million years uh, from now, in the past, we had a kind of snowball planet. Well, every year we gain new data, and so we do not know I exactly, but we can say 670 million years ago we had a glacial. Uh, or snowball earth and then it was succeeded by ice-based uh, earth. Today we just have the re remnants of ice. We have the Holocene at the upper edge with few ice and our Anthropocene giving us the chance to recap to uh, bring us back, to return us into an earth of the first uh, eras, so with no eyes at all except maybe for Himalaya or the uh, Andes. The sea level shows a variation of 70 meters between this part of history and the other. So without any ice, we, uh, we would see a sea level having increased by 70 to 65 meters. And when thinking about politicians, the error bars in our statements can be reduced only at a small pace because of the complex system. But Politicians must always make decisions in an uncertain setting. I ask myself, why do they ask us to provide more certainty than they actually can have? For example, in the European Union, we should have been more proactive in this field. But for climate, then the President of the United States of America says, I need sound science. Sound science, it means error margins of so small, unfeasible by the way, fully impossible. I was representative of, the, of Germany for the, constituting, for the constituting session of the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel of Climate Change. In 1990, the first assessment report, what did we say about what did about the, the system and variability of the climate system. We said during the second COP and of October in 1990, if the carbon dioxide in its concentration in the atmosphere 
actually doubled, then we would have to reckon with, with 1.4 to 1.5 uh, degrees Celsius of mean warming at the ground level. And in 2013, what did we say? The same. Because we actually recognized certain feedback mechanisms which we had neglected at first, we knew it was, there was a higher contribution, Gordon Mc, and we were told, Gordon McBean and me, <coughs> we, had, we were asked to draft chapter 11 of one of the reports of the IPCC, Reducing Uncertainties was the title. And then Bert Pauline said, us, said to us, we were the lead authors, I don't like this title. Because it might be that we com have a better understanding of something, but with more uncertainties going along. And then we rebaptized the chapter Improving Our Understanding. And then it was correct. So, so the question is, where is the end of the Anthropocene. Will Greenland and uh, the uh, Antarctic ice will disappear in terms of ice? We cannot say if actually Gre Greenland disappears at 2% two, two of mean warming. We do not know what actually is the result of two degrees Celsius of warming to Mr. Beuys, when he was mayor of Hamburg, I told him he should tell Angela Merkel and the president of the United Nations and urge them to have extreme climate protection because he wishes to have the city of Hamburg in the same condition in the future in 300 uh, in years from now in order to be able to avert the, uh, the higher sea level. And the marshlands, low marshlands in Hamburg might be lost after uh, two or three meters of rise of sea level within the next three centuries. So, as to differentiations, I'm going to speak about three differentiations. The first one is the, most, is the simplest for a climatologist. The response of the climate system to a disturbance of the composition of the atmosphere when being faced to long-lived and short-lived uh, additions in all times of, of uh, vulnerability to droughts and similar things. Then I have to speak now about what the impetus is. The main impetus comes from the world mixed greenhouse gases. CO2, methane, and O, but also the halo carbons, which should not be neglected for the greenhouse effect. On the other hand, we have other Anthro anthropogenic activities in terms of cooling down. But let's say when the whole world, if the whole world had diesel cars without root filters, without particle filters, then we would, would have an impact on the climate change. This is due to the emissions of sulfur dioxide, which will cause sulfur particles in the atmosphere, which have a scattering effect, are not absorbing at all, and then we have, would have more brightness of the planet with less sun reaching to the ground. And then, together with all the uncertainties we have, then we, we come to an imbalance of the radiation balance of about something more than two watts per, per square kilometers, uh, square meters, because such an 
The response of the climate system to such an imbalance is climate change. The only question is how many percents of input are active. We say two-thirds two -thirds are realized and one-third will follow later at a current rate of increase in emissions. And this impetus causes temperature changes. And we map this within the IPCC. This is the most serious approach. A lot of journalists ask me, because they just read something in science or nature, in it, and they wish to have an interpretation, I tell them, quiet, quiet, slowly, slowly, I'm sure that we, uh, we should have further co-researchers, we should have contradiction, and only in this contrasting exchange of views we will in the end come to an understanding because not every individual bubble in the, in the air can give rise to a journalistic article. So we have a lot of research done with minimum variation. Where do the differences come from? We can say very simply they did not use the same data mostly. In the UK, for example, they did not use certain data which were measured in the Arctic, whereas the US researchers used such data. And that is why we have a certain variation. This is Horizon 2010, but we have further uh, data. This is the NOAA the U.S. Weather Service showing the warmest years, hottest years since the beginning of recording, since about 1850, 1860. We have 1998, we have 2015, the year with absolute extreme, absolute peak, but there's a simple explanation. Then there was a very strong El Nino, and El Nino always means one to two degrees Celsius of rise of warming, mean warming, and then uh, with a s probability of about 50 percent, it will f be followed by a La Nina with a drop with a drop in temperature, and then other experts will say, where's your global warming? But that you always have to look at three or four de decades in order to come to a conclusion is very often forgotten and neglected. So this differentiation, you see a spot in the Atlantic Ocean area where, where there is no warming between 1901 and 2012. Now people say the Gulf Stream will break down, but we cannot say this. We cannot predict this because we do not have observation data long enough to allow us to make such a statement. During the past, during the past few decade, decades, we have a kind of shrinkage at that point, but we do not know whether we have a period long enough in observation. Maybe it's just a small outlier in the long run. But what we can see, we see that there is more rise in temperature in, in, on, in continents and very uh, honest by researchers we do not have any data for the two poles. So we cannot use that for speculation. When speculating, so we are allowed to speculate. We are a group that has general license to speculate. But we must say that we speculate and what the physical arguments or what chemical knowledge is used in order to come to our speculations. And let's have a look at the change in precipitation over land. And you might be disappointed when seeing these less expressive maps. 
John in 2013. So when looking at the past 50 years, a bit more than the past 50 years, then we see that there is more precipitation in large regions in higher altitudes, but we have more droughts, for example, in the Mediterranean area. That means less precipitation in these regions. And what we now see in Canada is not a proof, but when totaling the fires in the world during the past few 20 or 30 years, then you will see that it's always in the Mediterranean climate zones or at the limit board and the boundary between the moderate and higher moderate uh, latitudes. That means at the board boundary between boreal forest and the prairie. And when looking even closer, and you can see that most of the fires are anthropogenic. That means it's not about climatic change, but it's about people having matches. And there's a country that managed to reduce fires of this type. In France, it was possible. They did the following. They said anywhere where there are Forests that had been burned, that uh, were de destroyed by fires, there's no license or no permit to construct houses or buildings. And so they were able to reduce the fires, but in Spain and Portugal, there's no such regulation yet. We can say we have more drought in certain regions, but in total, and it can also be written the RE in the assessment report of the IPCC, we have more water coming from the sky, there's more precipitation, more rain, because we have a formula behind and all uh, and, and a formula that's not very much liked, that is especially by geographic scientists, because they do not like math. That's the clausius Clapeyronian formula. If we ha when we have one degree of rise in temperature, then we have a maximum concentration of vapor, of water vapor, by a rise by uh, 8 to 20 percent. 20% per degree, but uh, above 20, 20 degrees Celsius, we have 6% of growth of water vapor. And because the lower edge of clouds uh, are between one, 0 and 10 degrees of centigrade, we can say that 7% of growth of water vapor is existing for each degree Celsius of rice. And, and when there are the same dynamics of air flows, then we will have precipitation. That means 6 to 8 percent of more rain in each event of precipitation. In Saxony, it was actually seen, for example, in Georgenfeld. These are the typical extreme events. When we have uh, warming, then a new extreme event is more or less unavoidable and will come. Let's have a look at the third variant. We spoke about temperature and precipitation. And now let's come to the sea level. You see an acceleration in the rise of the sea level from about 0.8 millimeter per year, millimeters per year for the late 19th century and beginning 20th century. Now we have a steeper rise and now we have less fluctuation because now we have satellite data with much more exact results and findings, the red dots are the radar altimeters from satellites from space and the Europeans now have operationalized this approach. We will have a permanent observation of the sea level changes from space for each ocean basin. It can be shown. I showed it here for the global ocean. We have more regionalization even. There's a new satellite, Cryosat 2, 
launched by the Europeans, constructed by the European Spatial Authority with systematic measurement and high precision measurement that we have meanwhile time series of four or five years allowing us to come to a statement which of the glaciers in uh, Greenland uh, are lose their substance more or less. The Ispray, Jakobshagen Ispray, this is the uh, fastest glacier of the world with a movement of one meter per hour and at a moment where it actually gets into the ocean and throws more water in the ocean than the Rhine at its mouth, at its estuary. And this uh, south border of uh, Greenland seems to have become a melting candidate in the north and in the medium regions. There is a growth and an even higher ice cake due to warming. Now, a bad, now so bad news for all those living in the tropics. What will happen when Antarctic ice and Greenland ice will melt? then you might think that there will be a rise in sea level close to, cl but it's not physical. In physics, we can see Mars was lost in Greenland. This causes a, a loss in gravity, and that is why the water and loss in gravity is higher in the tropics, and that is why we have a threat for the Philippines, for example, due to the melts in the northern ice sheet. In the Ger German bays, we have an average uh, sea level rise of three millimeters per year, but along the Pas Pacific, down to the Philippines, there we have an average uh, sea level rise one centimeter during the past 20, 23 years. That might change because there's also a dependency on La Nina El Nino, but the probability that melting Greenland ice and uh, West Antarctic ice will cause sea level rises in the tropics. Now to summarize the first chapter, the first differentiation, this is a map that shows the percentage change of toward days <coughs> for the scenario RCP 8.5 at, at the end of the 21st century and a change to our times nowadays. So although it's raining more, there will be more trots because with higher temperature, water evaporates uh, more from the surface. And you see only a few areas where the models think that there will be a reduction of trots. As an example, in 2008, there was an extreme drought in Syria. 1.5 million uh, Syrians went uh, to the cities, almost all the farmers, because they couldn't harvest anything. There was a big drought, so not even five kilograms of wheat were be able to harvest from one hectare. And so since the people have to survive, they go to the cities. And so th there was a big trouble uh, within uh, Syria. This was not uh, the cause for the civil war there, but it was also one aspect. The second differentiation, who are the causes, the causes for the mean global warming? So when I ask the auditory who emits uh, most uh, per capita of uh, the public, United States, Saudis, uh, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait. Kuwait. The answer is Qatar. <laughs> the answer is Qatar. 
45 tons per citizen and year. And where is Germany in this rating? By 10. A 10. A, a little lower than 10. And when were we the champions? When were we the world champions of emitting uh, per capita in Germany? In 1989, in uh, East Germany, in GDR, with 22 tons per uh, person and year. And now uh, compare the life standard of 11 tons in Germany right now and 22 tons in the ex-GDR. So there is a different, um, there was a different energy supply system with a lower efficiency with brown coal and not very efficient. So in the apartment of my aunt connected to the charity, there was a heat wave in July when I visited her and I found a hot heater in the living room and the window was open. So that's always like this with us, but uh, the heating was not possible to reduce. And so I told them I need a, a Frenchman, that <laughs> means a wretched. <laughs> so, so the heating uh, is blocked and the heating system is blocked and I want to repair it. <laughs> so they rather use the term English person for uh, this tool. So I got the correct tool to repair the heating system. So these are the differences in emissions. And now we have a look how the impact of the humans. So this gray area in gigatons of carbon flow uh, per year into the Earth atmosphere because of fossil uh, fuels and uh, cemetery industry, cement industry. So in 2013, it was nine gigatons. And uh, this block tells us how much we destroy forests and savannah. So this was reduced, this got less. So we don't destroy the forest so much, it gets less, it didn't increase. But this is also because there are no forests in some countries anymore. And then there is the question, what will be uh, the progress in the future when we look at the, the oceans? The oceans uh, take up two to two and a half gigatons of carbon uh, per year. And this light blue area, this is how much is left in the atmosphere. And the green part is how much goes into the vegetation, the plant. So a fir that doesn't have the air pollution anymore on the ore mountains, the global warming is something uh, good for this tree because it reacts, the plant reacts to the uh, carbon dioxide shower. And with the same amount of water, there will be more biomass built up uh, than before because the gap openings at the needles don't have to be open such a long time to have the same amount of uh, carbon dioxide. And if there is enough water, then there will be more biomass and 
most trees in Europe have now thicker annual rings. So that's a lot what goes into vegetation. That's about the same amount that goes into the oceans. And this is specified in this image. So 3.0 gigatons plus minus 0.8 goes into soil and vegetation on land. 2.6 goes into the ocean because of destruction of vegetation and forest. It's about one gigaton that uh, comes out additionally and the big amount, uh, the use of fossil fuels. And now we have the differentiation. So this is an image of Le Carré. Uh, it was published last year. So the developing countries and grey energy is almost on the side effect. So in 1990, when there was the convention for the climate change, when we were asking for this convention, and then in 1992 it was actually accepted in Rio, Rio de Janeiro. So the non-annex B uh, countries, the developing countries, and the, uh, emitted less than the annex B countries. So these were uh, the later Kyoto Protocol countries. And for 30 years they haven't emitted more, but China and India and Indonesia and Brazil, they went up like this. And now we have the following problem of very high emissions in parts of the developing countries. So they are even higher than the highly industrial countries. But then there's always the argument, the globalization uh, has a lot of grey energy because when you produce child toys, are sometimes poisonous but allowed, when you buy this from China, then the emissions for the production of these toys will be in China. And so many people say, okay, uh, in Switzerland there are, is no steel production anymore, this is exported, and so the high emissions will be in China. And so you can ask how much is the difference in emission transfers, that's how it is called. So this is about 0.3 gigatons of carbon. Because when you think of this, we import uh, goods from China, not only poisonous toys for children, but also cameras. And this production uh, was made in China, but we deliver uh, the whole plants the whole uh, factories to China and they were made here and so the high emissions were here. So that's why there is not such a big difference of emission transfer. So how much would we need for climate protection? How many nations? So after four we could stop already. So China, United States, European Union and uh, India. So maybe also the Russian Federation. But uh, it, <laughs> it doesn't react so good to political uh, actions. Per capita emissions, you can see the United Arab Emirates, Qatar is not there because it's too small for this list, but per capita emissions, uh, this bar would be ending about there. But you can also see international aviation, and then you might be surprised, this is not very much. So flights globally don't contribute so much uh, to carbon emissions, it's about 2%. And international shipping, 
And this increased a lot because of globalization, because there is more trade and more transport. So you see the difference here between 1990 and 2012. So the fairy tale that only the industrialized countries are responsible for the increase of CO2 in the atmosphere is not correct anymore. So everybody has to react Nun now, and this was uh, decided upon in Paris. And now the good news, a uh, change in the tendency, the red point for 2015 shows for the first time a stagnation with a heavy global uh, economic increase. So we are at 10 gigatons carbon uh, per year. So these are the fossil fuels and cement production. Here you see the uh, economic crisis. Here you see the Gorbachev effect because he uh, destructed uh, the Soviet Union. And then for 10 years, uh, the emissions almost uh, did not rise on a worldwide scale, scale because the former socialist countries uh, the uh, emissions decreased, like Lithuania e and Ukraine and so on. You've seen maybe the Ukraine in the image before because there are almost no emissions anymore compared uh, to the socialist times. And now the red dot is at 3% of global uh, economic growth uh, is stable now. If I had told you this three years ago, then the energy specialist, specialist would have called me an illusionist or the other way around. Since 2013, the investment in renewable energy systems uh, are uh, higher than investments in fossil, uh, fossil fuel uh, plants. And so that's why there we have this effect. And uh, the most important uh, cause for this stagnation is China, because there is really a program for uh, renewable energy. <laughs> So this was the, the aim, uh, two degrees Celsius. So there would be a more warming by one degree. We already had one degree, and then there would be a second degree. But regarding the radiation force, it's only 2.6 per square meters compared to the 8.5. So this is a horror scenario because it can never uh, start. Because if there is really some hazard or threat, of climate change, then in this extreme emissions, uh, the world uh, economic system uh, would have negative uh, impact, and then the emissions uh, would be reduced. So this is really just an illusion, 8.5 watt per square meters. And compared to the image that we used before of the stagnation, uh, we won't go into this direction. So the question is now, can we really make this, this two degree uh, Celsius target? And now the third differentiation. Station, who has to do something, when and what. So the European Union does more than any others. And so our chancellor is really uh, the force that is speeding this up. And our people didn't understand this, what she was able to uh, make in the European uh, Union. So the renewable energy systems must supply the energy for our civilization in the future. The question is how fast we can go do this. And if we only use the wind in Germany, then it's not possible even now, today. We could maximum uh, supply one watt per square meters 
uh, wind energy, but we need 1.5 watt per square meters. So this is the energy flow density of the uh, German system. So the whole German Federal Republic uh, using wind turbines could not solve our energy problem. And that's why already in 2003, when uh, there was a big uh, report uh, and uh, they advised uh, to use the sun. So with all other renewable energy, uh, people are disturbed or it's not uh, efficient enough or not enough uh, supply. So some targets for the next future. So the European Union, must emit 20% less carbon dioxide uh, until 2020 compared to 1990 and uh, it should increase uh, the energy efficiency by 20%. So this is not binding. So this is the decision of the European Council uh, of 2007 and for Germany minus 40% in carbon dioxide is binding and that's why our economic minister asked uh, the coal industry to reduce the capacity for coal 2.5 percent, uh, especially brown coal, and so that there are no uh, problems like in the nuclear industry. Uh, he gave to the industry 1.6 million euros, and so the industry agreed to it. So. 2.5 gigawatt uh, should be reduced in the whole German Federal Republic and it's up to the industry where they do this. But when we uh, go forward a little bit more, so the day before yesterday I downloaded this from the internet, Angora Made. Uh, Angora Meta, you can uh, Google this, and then you get this image. There's only a delay of two or three hours to the current date. So this was during the last days, the situation in Germany. We had so much renewable energy that we could supply 70 to 80% of the energy market and the brown coal uh, was uh, necessary to be regulated and the industrial companies uh, don't want to do this because they earn less and in this situation uh, the energy in Leipzig uh, costs minus one euro cent. So they have to give something actually, they don't get anything. So this is a very curious uh, situation that we always have in May, June and July. In winter time it's different. As a meteorologist I have to tell you, please calculate uh, to the German weather service especially, please calculate how many days we have high pressure systems in the middle of Europe from the end of December to mid of January. So this is important for the energy. So when we had a statement that it's never longer than six days or eight days and the future development will be like this, uh, this is a basis about for the debate uh, for the energy change. So if you have this already, please show it to us today. So next time there will be a presentation about this topic. So this would be ideal. The public has to know this. When there is a fog over the whole of Germany and the wind uh, force is two to three, then you cannot use uh, the most important renewable energies like sun and wind and then you need some system. You have to import uh, energy from the Normandy or from Italy or you need big storage systems. And now I get back.
to Article 2 of Paris. So there, a, a threatening climate change was defined. And it tells you here, holding the increase in the global average temperature to well below 2 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels and to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees centigrade. So this was uh, decided by the developing countries and the small island states. They pushed it into it not knowing that 1.5 uh, degrees is already in the system right now, and tomorrow all emissions, we would have to cut all emissions if we want to make this. So the climatologists know about this for a longer time, but that's how political decisions are made, and rather a sharp uh, target than so all the politicians have to stick to this now, to this extreme uh, definition. And in Article 4, there is something even more brutal to achieve a balance between anthropogenic emissions by sources and removals by things of greenhouse gases in the second half of this century. So this is the implementation of decarbonization of the G7 uh, summit in Elmau. So decarbonization is not uh, written there because this is a back uh, door for carbon capture and storage. Because when we reach 1.5 degrees Celsius, then this is only possible by taking out carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So you can do this by forestation, you can do this by a different kind of agriculture, but it would be easier to push carbon dioxide into uh, deeper layers of soil. And that's why decarbonization is not written there, but the Chancellor uh, was still able to push this in during the summit in Elmau against the Canadians and the Australians that didn't like to hear this. So the financial aspect is regulated that way, that building up on 100 billion US dollars per year or even more, uh, we support uh, adaptation to climate change in developing countries. And now there is so much in the pot uh, that they started big projects to distribute this money. So Germany uh, added seven billion uh, dollars and uh, America much more. And so this wave of Paris, uh, most of the countries wanted to show that they take it very seriously. Compensation for loss and damage by climate change. And uh, now it's written, decides on the continuation of the Warsaw International Mechanism for Loss and Damage associated with climate change impacts following the re review in 2016. So there will be legal action. And what to or other bodies, entities will actually file legal actions, take legal action against industry, industries. At a certain point, we have more and more legal action, and in the end, climatologists, as we here in the room, we will be asked or requested to integrate our voice, to utter our voice to give our opinion. Is there actually a contribution related thereto? That's a very tricky thing. So it's time to come to the end. Steps to come. IPCC report, assessment report requested for 2018 as to the 1.5 degrees target. Are, so the report and the AR6 of the IPCC about 2021, increase in voluntary commitments every five years, nobody uh, is allowed to step back, research 
in terms of control systems uh, or network technology, storage and increasing efficiency and changes in lifestyle. And I hope that actually action will follow redistribution of money of funds for example, to take away some money from Fusion and to invest it there and to make winners out of alleged losers. Saudi Arabia said after Paris, they said, we now set up a solar program, 9.5 gigawatts, because in the future we will earn our money with solar and not with oil and petrol. Thank you for listening. Many thanks. You already warned, in warned us that it might be a bit longer. Maybe one question anyway. Uh, is that Not a question, um, but, eine, 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 but a eine, comment eine, on regenerative um, energies. The, the statement that uh, in the Germany, when, we sp and, and when using wind, sun and so on, uh, will not come through the winter, but storage is, let's say, the crucial point. And the second point is European electricity consumption. So it would be feasible, yeah, technologically, but it will cost many billions. But we, ha we have them, the mi uh, billions. Unfortunately, I must uh, leave you now. Yes, I was. No, no, not so quick. Many thanks for the enrichment, for adding to the wealth of our 